everybody. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Those of you who were here last night, it's really great to see you again. Those of you who are here tonight for the first time, we're so happy to see you for the first time this week. Um, the first of many, I'm sure. Um, this evening's concert is something I'm extremely excited about, um, and, and it's going to bring this dimension to this festival that we just haven't been able to introduce into the early music spectrum as yet, so I'm thrilled about that, and our uh, pre-concert talk should, should uh, be really illuminating. We have here um, Tomas Lozano, a board member of BLEM, an all-around amazing musician and human being, and we have here Amir Al Safar, who is the musical director of uh, of Safa Fear, and came here to New York just to be with you all tonight. And I'm so pleased to meet you in person. Pleased to meet you too. Okay, well, take it away, guys. <laughs> well, first of all, welcome, Amir. Thank you so much. And, you know, we're so I am so delighted and so glad that we finally were able to bring Amir and his full band with family to Bloomington. These guys that travel all over the world and finally the world came to us. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk a little bit about or I'm gonna ask him to talk about the traditions and the music that they play, the Makam, which is the classical music of Iraq. And uh, just if you didn't know in 2003 the Makam was proclaimed by UNESCO the tangible cultural heritage of humanity. And it was inscribed in 2008. And it's a little bit interesting that it was at the same time that the U.S. invaded Iraq. Mm -hmm. At the same time that it was proclaimed uh, a tangible cultural heritage of humanity. But I'd like to ask you, for the audience that we have, you don't know, know what the Makam is. If you can tell us, what is the Makam? Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, yeah. good evening. <laughs> nice to meet all of you. In a nutshell. Um, yeah, Makam in a nutshell. Uh, how, how many days do we have? <laughs> how many years do we have? Because um, when I was first studying uh, Iraqi Makam, um, I, I started around 2001-2002, and um, I had been learning about different Makam traditions from the Arab world, from Turkey, um, Central Asia, North Africa. There's a Makam, as a general practice, is, uh, is found I say everywhere from Morocco to Western China. It's a very big part of the world, and most people have never heard the word Makam, or very, very few. It's not, a, it's not common in our, not as common as, as say, Raga, because um, we didn't have a, a Ravi Shankar at Monterey in, in 1967 or whatever. So, but, um, but Makam is, is basically a modal system. So modes are like scales, and they tend to be seven note scales, similar to Western major and minor. Um, but what distinguishes Makam scales from, let's say, Western or Western European scales is the, is the microtonality. So oftentimes in a seven note mode, some of the notes might be in common with, say, the notes on the piano, but there'll be certain notes that are quarter tones or even very, very fine gradations of pitch. So the difference between a Turkish performer and an Iraqi performer can be discerned by the pitch. Um, if they're playing 30 cents, that's 30 one hundredths of a half step below or thirty six cents, you know, very, very micro gradations of pitch that that sort of would signal in a listener um, which mode we're playing in, what which era, which region and, and so on. And then of course in performance there's a lot of expression that a lot of the expressivity of the Mokam is in the singer or the string players. Um, bending pitch but but not just bending some in between vague nebulous microtonal. It's very, very specific. Um, but it, the, the part that took me a long time to answer in my own quest was about Iraqi Makam, which is one version, one, one tradition within this larger milieu of, of Makam traditions. And the Iraqi Makam is more like a repertoire. They're, they're kind of like songs, except that there's no rhythm that sort of what we know, normally know as songs that would have like a rhythmic structure. The, the singing is rhythmically free, and the poetry can be changed from performance to performance. So usually a song has words that you know that kind of are set on a rhythm. But in Makam performance, because the poetry and because, because it's rhythmically free, there's a lot of melisma, like these long phrases uh, on one syllable or one word. Um, and those are semi-improvised. So um, 
on the one hand, it seems very free and improvisatory, but once you get into the details, you start learning that there's um, very kind of a finite way in which these improvisations um, can take place, and, and in some ways, certain elements are very scripted and very prescribed. So, hopefully, that gives you a general sense. Um, when you listen, I think you'll you'll get an even better sense of what the formal comments. And can you tell us a little bit how how old do you think the this tradition of the classical Makami in Iraq is? It's, so I often answer the question that, it, so we're, talk, we're talking about early music, well, elements of Makam are, are early, early, you know, like 5,000 year old early music. Um, for instance, the Santur um, was invented, well, it's the descendant of the, the Sumerian harp, which some of you might have seen this harp with the golden bull's head at the, at the um, end. That was in, that's from about 3500 uh, BC, and around sometime around 1000 BC, we start to see a version of that that's laid flat and played with mallets. It could have been played, it could have been from earlier, but that's when we know that this instrument was was practiced in in late Akkadian, early Babylonian, or the second Babylonian era. So around 3000 years. So that instrument itself and the jose, which is the um, kind of a spike fiddle. Um, which you, both instruments you're going to hear tonight, um, also dates to that time. Like they were instruments in Hammurabi's orchestra, so they're, they're quite ancient. Um, but the actual musical content of that era, we don't really know. We have Sumerian um, tablets, Babylon, actually Babylonian tablets from 1750 BC, that indicate a modal system that looks very much like the Western modal system of today. In fact, it's identical. Um, so it's, you know, that's those elements um, that are still present in the music, but the actual melodies, the words, the the inflection, the ornamentation, um, probably is dates back to Baghdad's um, glorious age when Baghdad was the seat of the Islamic Empire. So it's you know this incredibly rich and flourishing. It was you know the New York or the or the I don't know maybe what the next city is Hong Kong of of, of its time, um, but it was also um, for, yeah, for 500 years. So, so there was a lot of musical advancement that happened during that era, a lot of musicians from all over the um, Islamic Empire that were congregating in, in, in Iraq. So, um, but then there's also other elements that are only two or three, four hundred years old that came with the Turkish, or the Ottoman occupations of Iraq. So it's, it's I feel like it's, it's both very ancient, but when we perform it, like we're going to perform tonight, then it's, Contemporary because yes. we're making the sound in the moment and, and every performance is unique. So, yeah. I wanted to ask you because you know that people here they're not used to these relations with you know with the, with the music and the musicians and in the in here you are. Yeah. In the Iraqi tradition, the relationship between the singer that has this akari is very important and the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a counterpoint with the, uh, I would say, with the traditional orchestra or ensemble of early music mm -hmm. in the Western world. Yeah, um, so the, the, you, you said the word qari, right? Qari which is reciter, which is also the word that's used for um, Quran reciters, and it is partly because often these people who recite the maqam are also uh, reciters of, of holy liturgical texts, the, the, the Quran, but also the Torah, also the Christian hymns, I mean, it's, it's religious music and it's also secular. It depends really on, on which text is chosen. And sometimes even the text is unclear whether the beloved is um, a human, in human form or whether it's the divine, like a lot of Sufi poetry we're familiar with. So the term qari kind of elevates the status of the vocalist to someone kind of who's um, proclaiming or reciting um, not only the words but also imparting these melodies that sort of are more like channeled through them as opposed to them sort of, as opposed to them being like a, an individual singing. I don't know if it's, it's a tricky distinction, but um, um, but then the accompanying ensemble is is kind of often following the party. So as opposed to having counterpoint or like harmony where you'd have like a chord and the harpsichord and then a vocalist, what you'll hear the instruments doing behind the singer is kind of m mimicking or shadowing the melody, but also ornamenting at the same time, and sort of, so the melody is prime, is, is the main focus, 
but a, decorating the melody will be multiple versions of it happening, but always, um, you know, the, the instruments are kind of in the service of the vocal, but then of course there's also instrumental solos and, and interludes that happen as well. And then there's a few rare ins instances where the instruments actually lead the vocal to a modulation, to a new key or to a new section, so, um, but it's, it's a, very much a supportive role. And all these improvisation that happens in the Kari and the Indian musicians, how do they know when to come in and not to step into somebody else's? Because yeah, because you know, that's a, in, the, in the Western world everything is written, so you know when to come in, the other one knows when to come out. Yeah, but here you have this, uh, another approach to it. Yeah, it's not a strophic form in the typical sense, like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, instrumental interlude, bridge, it doesn't have those sort of clearly cut, um, but it, it's just really that everybody in the ensemble, uh, all the instrumentalists also know the vocal part, so almost, you know, oftentimes they, they will also be singers, maybe they don't perform, but they would be able to, they would know the melodies intimately, um, and that's kind of necessary in order to um, support all the nuances of these melodies and all the subtle intonation and, and ornamentation. Um, but there's also, th there's forms, and these forms are, are, are memorized um, by the performers, and, and also the listeners are, are usually familiar in an ideal context when you have these sort of connoisseur audiences which are dwindling today in Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that I have this question about, do you think that Macan has influenced and Western music in any kind, in any way? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we try to see things from one end and they're from, we try to separate everything, you know. Yeah. Nowadays with the specialization, everything is, they have compartmentalized, you know, things from every country. I mean, it's, as we know, things are way more connected than yeah. what we think. Yeah, even the, the Western and Eastern and Middle yeah. East and Western Europe, it, it, all, all these, definitions start to blur and, and the boundaries often are blurred. Um, but I mean the most clear and obvious example is, is like um, the Muslim presence in the Iberian Peninsula and southern Spain, also southern France and Italy for um, close to 700 years. Mm -hmm. It's not a short period of time, it's double the amount of time since the, since the US Constitution was signed. So it's, it's a very, very long period, a lot of influence life. Um, both ways, but, but in particular um, instruments such as the oud, el oud, which became lute, um, and, and these kind of troubadour ensembles that you see in developing in Southern Europe have are, are a direct uh, counterpart to these similar ensembles, like, like the one you're going to see tonight, or in other cases there'll be like a, a lute instrument, a violin, um, and these are kind of, you know, instrument instrumental ensembles and small troops that were found throughout Central Asia, even into Africa, even the early um, slave musicians that were in, in, in the Americas, they were playing banjo and violin and tambourine, which is kind of like the, the oud and the joza and the rit, it's like, you know, with the vocalist. So, um, you know, the question of origin, who started it, where did it begin, I mean, it's often, you, you start to find there's many answers to these questions, but Certainly there's been a lot of influence. And Henry George Farmer was an early ethnomusicologist who wrote extensively about the connection between music of the Arabs and how it influenced the history of European music, basically from just before the Renaissance into the you know, into the beginning of the Renaissance. Yeah. So there will be no Mozart without there will be no Mozart without these music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How is the Macam today? Today, um, in Iraq specifically, in Iraq specifically, it's just something that is still alive, or an uh, art that is dying. I, I, I know there's a lot of changes have happened in, yeah. the, in the recent years. Yeah, I mean, basically since the beginning. So if, if you go back a hundred years in Iraq, Maqam was performed everywhere. In um, it was the only music that was people really knew, especially in, in the cities. And Maqam is generally an urban tradition because it it's this sort of urban uh, cities tend to be melting pots of many different um, populations and, and people from all over the region. So, uh, like, Iraqi Maqam has influences from, from Turkish and from Persian and, 
and um, Gulf Arab and, and the Levant and all these sort of different melodies and different musical traditions that kind of meld into um, what we now know as the Iraqi maqam or what you're going to hear tonight is specifically the Baghdadi maqam. Um, but because, like you were saying about the compartmentalization, so there were different eras like um, when the Arab nationalism was, was very important, so a lot of Persian and Turkish elements were kind of in, intentionally filtered out sometimes by governments, sometimes by people to try to you know, make the music seem more Arab and more aligned with, let's say, Egyptian music, which was kind of the popular music um, of the whole Arab world throughout the 20th century. Um, Egyptian film music became very popular um, because Egypt kind of had this hegemony of, uh, in the entertainment industry, um, particularly music and film. So that music quickly became adopted by Iraqis who were eager to become modern um, with the British, um, you know, with the British occupation and mandate in Iraq in the uh, post World War One era. So um, there were a lot of societal changes, a lot of musical changes that have occurred in the last hundred years, um, but. In particular, the last 50 years of dictatorship and then invasion, occupation um, of the U.S. kind of caused the, the, the fabric of the society to, to fracture and fall apart. And so these gatherings in which, you know, people, people's background, no one cared whether someone was Sunni or Shia or Kurd or Christian in the old days when there was this large Jewish population in Iraq. There were, all these people were getting together. There were not only not only musicians and practitioners, but also the oshak. Oshak means the lovers um, of the maqam. So, um, and now because things are so fractured, it's there's not um, it's it's hard to keep these uh, traditions alive, and there's not a lot of state funding or state. There's not a lot of infrastructure. There are schools, but they don't really teach the maqam per se. They kind of teach the general. Arab and Turkish music, but not really um, focusing on, on the maqam and all of its detail and subtlety and nuance and richness. So, um, so right now, that Hamid has a, a teacher, a, a student in Baghdad who I just met uh, a few months ago, who's kind of the, the new torchbearer, who's really doing phenomenally, and, and he was on Iraq Idol, so it's like that. And, and he, he, I was shocked because I saw him, you know, there's usually pop singers that show up on this program and, and he showed up and I thought, okay, they're going to vote him off in round one because he's very, very stern and very traditional, but he kept advancing, advancing, and he made, he got third place. And because of that, his career launched, you know, got launched and now he's um, performing all over the country and, and he sounds wonderful. And so, you know, there are, there are a handful of people, um, but also in religious contexts, there are still practitioners and people. But not not the concert version, like what you're going to hear. Like the cafe. Yeah, like the cafe, the coffee houses, but the concert version. Yeah. And uh, I'm gonna get you really tired. But can you tell us about the repertoire tonight? A little bit. Tonight's repertoire. Right here. Uh, we're going to perform. So in in the Mokam performance, Mokam is as I mentioned is, is kind of this composition. It's like this long form song that's recited poetry. And I'll, I'll give sort of synopsis of poetry uh, before each performance rather than reading the word line by line translation. Um, but each maqam is, before the maqam is what's called the introduction or muqaddima, which is usually a rhythmic piece um, performed by the santor and the joza and the percussion. Um, and then the maqam proper, which is the, the most, the longest and most substantial section, which is this long melismatic uh, po poems. Usually, the, every maqam is different. Some, some have rhythmic accompaniment, some don't. So we're going to present one maqam that doesn't have rhythmic accompaniment, two that, that do. Um, and then following the maqam is what's called a pesta. P-E-S-T-E-H, I guess would be the transliteration. And the pesta is like a popular song, much more lighthearted, and usually the lyrics are very simple and kind of more like everyday. Um, and they sort of balance, the maqam is sort of heavy and deep and the best is more light and, and if, if any of you happen to know the words, then you're welcome you to sing along or you can even clap. And, you know, there's a lot of audience participation in the pestat, it's sort of the, the joyful moment after the, the intense intensity of the maqam. So, um, and we're, so we're going to do three, the first one called maqam awj, 
which is based on a B. The, the mode is based on B half flat. So if you kind of pay attention to the tuning, you'll you'll yeah. notice that it's a different kind of scale than probably what you're used to, unless you have a lot of exposure. The second one is shot key rest, and that's mode of rest, which is like a kind of like the major scale, but the third and seventh degrees are lowered by roughly a quarter tone, maybe a third of a tone. And then maqam uh, medmi, and medmi is uh, kind of like a, is in the mode of hijaz, which is roughly the equivalent of the um, uh, harmonic minor mode, but on the fifth degree. I'm assuming there's a few musicians in the house. That there's, like, there's like eight families of, uh, yeah. Right? It's families of modes and they all have a name. So when you say, oh, we're going to play in Rast, everybody knows which note they need to play for that. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's about it. That's about it. Uh, any other any questions from the audience? I'm sure. Yes? Is uh, Makam also a chord music? Is there a. Yeah, there's a. It, that's where. A lot of the Mokam compositions were developed, especially during the Abbasid era, but even during the Ottoman era and, and during the Persian occupation, it was often you know, the sultans and the sheikhs that would have uh, Mokam performances in their, in their beautiful lavish courts. Yeah. But it's also coffee houses and outdoor spaces, and then of course um, mosques and synagogues and churches as well. It sounds like a very refined music instrument. I've heard the term classical like in the raga referred to it. Is there a meaningful distinction or a parallel or different folk or tradition that is very different or, or related? I mean, I'm assuming there is, music of the people or the villagers. And yeah. is, is there a meaningful overlap or is there a very dis are they distinct tradition? It's a very good question. And, and um, so there's, the maqam is generally an urban, if you, you know, the, the folk classical divide can be urban um, and, and rural. And so there is like a, a rural tradition that's, it's like almost, it mirrors the maqam, but it's, it's called atwar, tor is the singular, atwar is the plural. And these tors are much, they're more, um, so the, a maqam would, would almost consist of many different tors, many different melodies put together in a, in a, in a like, not a pastiche, but more like a, a form or a structured way. Whereas a toad would kind of, you would stay in one malady that would repeat with variations throughout. But, but there's, a, there's certain toads that exist as maqams, and certain maqams that exist as toads as well. And then there's other, because sometimes these toads can be very, very specific to a, you know, a, a region, and, and some of the intonation will be extremely different, and it won't really fit into the established sort of urban, um, re refined or, or more, um, structured kind of uh, intonation system. So um, I've listened to a lot of, and I've picked up a lot from Hamid sings some of the the Torah repertoire as well. Um, but generally, people are like usually in one or the other. Um, yeah. Are, are there such things as amateur practitioners, like in, in like a, a local person who's not professional, who's not trained, or in making something that's related to the Torah or the is that yeah. a common thing, or, or is it only the specialists? Historically, yeah, there were many, many, in fact, many of the great singers of the past, um, almost all of them had another profession. Um, so they weren't necessarily earning their income from, from uh, performances. The, the instrumentalists tended to be full-time uh, performers, but, you know, like one of the great Muqamers, Rashid Al-Qandarchi, Qandara is Shu, he was a shoe repair man, but, it, but he would also sing in the cafes, and in the courts, and uh, Muhammad Al-Gubanshi was, was kind of a, in, in trade, uh, and, and, but his, and that's, his name means like the, the weights, the measures, guy who, who weight, and, and so there was definitely a, a, a long tradition of amateurs who would often be very, very highly refined and specialized singers as well. Yeah. Yeah. We will love to take way, way, yeah. Yeah. I have a hundred more questions for Amir, but uh, they need to prepare and go to perform to the us with this incredible music that you guys are for a real treat tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.